Good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to our open forum on cyber ethics, cyber law, cyber psychology, and cyber bullying. My name is Jürgen Barkov. I'm the director of the Trinity Long Room Hub, the Arts and Humanities Research Institute uh, of Trinity College, which is organizing this event, which is part of the President of Ireland's Ethics Initiative. As the second in his series of public seminars, uh, the President this year has decided to challenge Irish society to raise the level of discourse on ethics, to discuss broadly the invitation of living ethically to draw out um, what a reflection on ethics might yield for a change in public consciousness and how such a debate should become or could become a catalyst for positive change. The President has invited the seven universities, the Dublin Institute of Technology and the Royal Irish Academy to um, debate ethical questions um, that the universities and all the institutions involved can choose. And in particular, he wanted us to focus on new challenges, on new uh, um, ethical issues uh, that technological and societal and scientific change brings about. Trinity College has four big public events uh, within this ethics initiative, and tonight is the second of such events. The first one was on the 17th of January, which was actually the very first event in the uh, President of Ireland's ethics initiative in the Science Gallery on synthetic biology and the challenges that our ability to design live uh, would bring with us. Tonight's event now is on uh, the impact of um, um, the internet on child development and on human behavior in general. Um, we are very fortunate to have three most distinguished experts in, in, from, in this field to address us tonight through uh, three experts from three different disciplines who have been researching the impact on the increasingly uncontrolled and around-the-clock access to the internet in a variety of fields. So um, I briefly introduce the three speakers now, now and then we hear um, their, their thoughts and, and perspectives, one after the other. And after that, the panel uh, which I will introduce in a moment, will then briefly respond to each other, and then we open this up to, um, uh, to, to a question and answer session with the audience. So let me introduce the panel. First of all, um, uh, the, uh, the moderator for the evening, which is Professor Patrick Gagan, historian and broadcaster, and also Dean of Undergraduate Studies in the University. He will, uh, he will moderate the discussion. And our three speakers in order of appearance, uh, Professor Owen O'Dell from the School of Law, who has been teaching and researching cyber law for 20 years, and most recently he advised the government on internet copyright as chair of the government's Copyright Review Commission. Our second speaker then is Mary Aiken, cyber psychologist and director of the Cyber Psychology Research Center at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. Mary um, has for years been at the forefront of this emerging discipline of cyber psychology. She has advised inter alia the Irish government, the EU commission, Interpol and the White House on how to deal uh, with the challenges that, uh, that the cyber technology poses for the way we bring up children and the environment in which they grow up. Our th third speaker then is Professor Conor McGuckin from the School of Education whose research focuses on understanding and preventing cyberbullying. We are really very grateful, grateful that you all um, have agreed to, to do this event. 
uh, on one of the areas that, that I think will, um, will have uh, are, are enormous areas for concern, but, but without further ado, I now want to hand over to our first speaker, Owen O'Dell. Hello, it's my uh, very great pleasure to have accepted Jürgen's invitation and to uh, share such a distinguished panel. Um, and I'm going to talk briefly today about cyber ethics and cyber law, sharing is caring, question mark. Now, privacy is dead, and the smoking gun, the trigger was pulled by social media. And this is a, um, a recent enough trope online, but in fact this idea that technology is killing privacy goes back a relatively long way. That is Scott McNeely. He is the uh, founder of Sun Microsystems, and in 1999, he gave us the first privacy is dead statement. You have no privacy anyway, he said, charmingly, get over it. <laughs> this man, Vint Cerf, one of the uh, founders of the internet, uh, he has the wonderful title in Google of Chief Internet Evangelist. Um, almost as uh, good a title as, you know, visionary. Um, and what he said to the uh, Federal Trade Commission uh, uh, just before Christmas is that privacy is an anomaly. Um, and the implication is that technology is removing that anomaly. And Google, the implication is, is at the forefront of the removal of that anomaly. And I want to speak about three ways in which we need to think about um, how technology is impacting on our privacy, and more to the point, impacting negatively on our privacy, and what we, how we need to think about responding to that. Now, the first way, the obvious way, is when we physically give the information. We fill in a form like that. When you booked for today with Eventbrite, you gave them some information about you. Um, and we're all conscious, kind of, of filling in a form and giving information. What we're not conscious of is the amount of information that is taken from us as we go about our daily online lives. I have a, uh, a smartphone. It uses a lot of power very quickly. I'm sure a lot of you have a similar device that uses a lot of power very quickly. And you wonder why? Well, the reason why is because all your apps are giving all your information back to headquarters. Um, everything you do on your phone is open to everything else on the phone. And potentially, um, each app with access to information on your phone can send it back to Cupertino or wherever, um, where all that information about you is being mined by the companies. We are very lazy when it comes to technology. We adopt the default. And all of our apps, all of our engagement with websites tend to default to open, and in particular, open to the website, open to the um, service provider. It is important that we take control of our data, but we rarely do. Now, the most important part is not the, is not the joke about the food being free, but the line across the bottom. If you're not paying for it, you're not the customer, you're the product. You pay for free online uh, resources with your information. And in the line of the great movie in the early 90s, Sneakers, it's all about the information, your information, which you are giving them or letting them take. Um, this is a, a very good article uh, in uh, Ars Technica about a, uh, an Austrian law student, law students get everywhere, uh, but this guy is actually one of the good guys, perhaps, uh, called Max Schrems. Um, Jürgen will correct my German pronunciation, I'm not even going to try. Um, who wanted to find out how much information Facebook had on him. And they refused access to that information. He took a complaint to the relevant Data Protection Commissioner, which is the Irish Data Protection Commissioner, because Facebook are established for Europe in Ireland and therefore Irish law and Irish regulation and therefore the Irish data protection uh, regime applied. Um, and eventually the um, regulator did two things. First he held in favor of Max and Max got a PDF 
of all of the data that Facebook had on him. He has a very small minor account, but the amount of information they were able to mine out of that account when printed out on PDF went to this height. Um, and then the regulator um, opened a full investigation on Facebook um, and uh, has required Facebook to be more compliant. Remember about 18 months ago when Facebook changed its privacy policies? It was doing so on foot of the Irish Data Protection Commissioner's requirements. Um, there is an ongoing reform of data protection law in the European Union. It was passed by the Parliament last week. It is now before the Council. Um, it's not perfect, but it does contain stronger rights for the data subjects. That is to say, people like you and me. Uh, um, whose data it is that Facebook and so on are mining. So the first story is the story of the data that we give or leave behind that the companies are using. We need to think about that. We can't expect people like Max Schrems to protect us. We can't expect the regulators always to be able to protect us. They can protect in general, but we need to take personal responsibility as well beyond that, which means we need to think about how important our privacy is. Okay, the second story is the amount of information we make public, the amount of information we knowingly share. Uh, and sometimes things can go wrong in ways that are entirely predictable. You put a notice on Facebook, there's a party, well, lots of people are going to turn up. Um, whether it's uh, a small village in West Cork being uh, overrun by drunk teens, uh, I don't quite know what the story is, but it's a great headline, um, uh, or uh, a one million home in London being gatecrashed by up to 600 revelers. Now, given that I've only got about 30 friends on Facebook, hopefully that wouldn't happen to me, but this is just a small example. Things can get a lot more serious on social media. Anybody at Slane last summer? There's me. <laughs> um, more to the point, Slane, those of you who think about Slane and social media will uh, probably think about Slane Girl um, or Rugby Girl. Uh, these are situations, uh, these are stories that were big on the normal media um, where uh, very private information and very private photographs were shared widely on the social media. Um, and so we need to be aware of the potential for things to go viral. Ugly word, overused word, but the idea is obvious that it will algorithmically expand. Um, so we need to be aware of the fact that when we put information out there, um, we lose control of it. And it goes into the wild beyond our control. Worse than that, um, the, uh, the social engagement platforms allow for, and this is uh, Spun Out, which is a, uh, an Irish teen website, um, uh, allows for cyberbullying. Connor is going to talk more about that. Um, but it's very hard for the law to engage with that sort of issue. We have, for example, um, well, Actually, we don't have uh, any Irish legislation or any European legislation dealing with cyberbullying. It's a very important issue, a very practical issue on the ground. We have uh, standard legislation that is being cross-applied, but other jurisdictions like Canada and Australia, uh, sorry, New Zealand, are currently looking at specific legislation engaging with cyberbullying and in particular with anonymous cyberbullying uh, because of the um, uh, significant ne negative consequences that the um, increase in range um, that technology brings uh, to, to bullying. And the third thing we need to think about is state monitoring. Now, um, this is from one of the great movies of um, uh, this century. Um, these are slides from um, the Simpsons movie. And uh, this is a conversation that takes place when uh, Lisa and Bart and Marge 
are running away from Springfield where uh, they have escaped from the dome, uh, which was a, a criminal offence. Um, and they're on a train to Seattle. Um, not sure why Seattle, but I'm sure there's some sort of tech echo going on there. Um, and uh, uh, Bart and Marge are talking about escaping and when they're going to meet the uh, when they're going to meet Homer. Um, and Lisa says um, they shouldn't be talking so loud. And Marge shirts her up by saying, "Yeah, no, nobody's listening." Well, the government is listening, and the government caught them. Um, now, this was meant as satire. But as we all know, it was actually true. Um, now, my real problem with prison is not the widespread, unregulated monitoring, but the fact that their slides are so ugly. <laughs> this, this is one of the prison slides on, on, on Wikipedia, and it's just an ugly, ugly slide. You know, if they've got the technology to monitor um, every electronic communication in the world, maybe they've got the technology to do something a bit better with, with, with um, PowerPoint. Um, and the justification for, um, for systems like PRISM is if you've got nothing to hide, then you've got nothing to fear. It's the standard uh, quote, which is usually met with the uh, Benjamin Franklin, uh, those who would sa sacrifice liberty for security uh, end up with neither. Um, last week, in a case brought by Digital Rights Ireland, um, an Irish-based uh, rights advocacy group uh, for rights in the digital environment, uh, the European Court of Justice said that data retention of the kind being conducted by uh, the NSA with very little statutory basis, in Europe there was a directive allowing for it, that this data retention is an interference with the fundamental rights of practically the entire European population. And the court struck down the data retention directive as a consequence. Uh, so the court is thinking about our privacy rights, uh, but we need to think about our privacy rights too. You don't need to um, read this um, uh, slide in detail, just know that um, on the left is the United States, uh, in the middle is China, on the right is Brazil, and red is um, privacy is a good thing, blue is privacy is not so important. And in the States, public opinion is very much in favor of privacy. In China, not so much. What a surprise. Um, now, Hansel and Gretel going through the woods, um, uh, but they leave a digital trail, and we all leave this digital trail. Uh, there is eavesdropping and monitoring. Uh, there is a satellite or a drone. Um, there is a CCTV camera. Uh, there is um, a, an electronic uh, uh, fund transfer. Uh, there is internet, um, uh, and when this, when this slide was, was made, um, internet was primarily, though not exclusively, on um, desktop machines. Um, but they did have PDAs, and that they were probably internet enabled. Um, uh, every time you conduct a back transaction, um, there's almost certainly a CCTV camera. There is uh, all the information you were leaving about your electronic life. Um, there is, of course, just somebody snooping, uh, in this case, the, the Wicked Witch. And finally, of course, if you used a, an old-fashioned analog telephone, uh, you could be bugged. Um, to this slide could be added a whole lot more because according as we get technology, as according as we get more technology, we get more ways to interact and to leave our digital trail. This is a slide about um, how safe the, the data in that digital trail actually is. Um, uh, the, the bigger the bubble, the bigger the breach of the, uh, of the um, safety of the information. So Evernote, Living Social, and Yahoo, 50 million, 50 million, and 22 million um, uh, information about th that number of subscribers leaked. And the color code, the purple, is when the websites are hacked. And this is before we knew about Heartbleed. This is before we knew that there was a simple means of hacking the websites. This is the stuff we know about. Not necessarily the stuff that uh, the NSA via Heartbleed got additional to what they already had. 
Um, the latest year for which we have figures in Ireland um, is 2012 from the um, Data Protection Commissioner. Um, they received 1,592 in Trinity, an interesting number, um, uh, uh, notifications of breaches. Uh, about um, uh, 450 of them were relating to technology. And this does not include, for example, the breach that we discovered, which started with 3,000 super value customers and spread to 1.5 million people all over, uh, all over Europe um, with the company in Clare uh, whose uh, website uh, data was hacked. So um, 450 sufficiently serious breaches to notify to the Data Protection Commissioner on the basis of Irish um, breaches alone. That's a lot of breaches that are sufficiently serious to notify. Um, and most of us here were probably affected by at least one of them, and we probably didn't even know about it. Um, Snowden. How you think about Snowden potentially tells you how you think about privacy. And my theme today is that we need to think about privacy. We need to talk about privacy. We need to understand what the challenges to privacy online are and how we ought to respond to those challenges. Um, uh, whether it is in a situation of uh, my, my, my father, whose visions of privacy were probably unchanged from his father's, uh, to my sense of privacy, which is probably more open than my dad's is, to my son's sense of privacy, which is even more open again because he is, in the horrible phrase, a digital native entirely comfortable with um, sharing. Now, this is a, an image from the uh, front page of today's New York Times. Um, and the New York Times has mislabeled this. They said this is a selfie. It isn't. It is a photograph of two people taking a selfie uh, in exactly the same way as the um, three world leaders at the Mandela funeral selfie isn't actually a selfie, it's a photograph of the three of them taking a selfie, and that selfie isn't available. Um, we've always taken photographs. For so long as um, uh, the, 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 it has been possible to take photographs, and before that there have been portraits and self-portraits, we've always wanted to record our image. The big new challenge is not the fact of the selfie, but the fact of the sharing of the selfie. Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, anybody seen The Princess Bride? Want to finish that line? Morons, exactly, yes. Um, they also happen to be uh, the, the great Greek philosophers. Um, and I'm just putting an image of the, of the Greek philosophers up there, not because they have anything to say about selfies. Um, this is as close as they got to selfies in ancient Greece. Um, but instead, just to reinforce the point that we need a philosophy of online living. Um, we're in the process of making a significant transition. We are transitioning, horrible word, but accurate in the circumstances, uh, from an almost entirely offline existence to an almost entirely online existence. Um, the law will protect us from the excesses, but it won't protect us from ourselves. We have a duty in those circumstances to develop a personal and social philosophy of online living. And we need to do it before it's too late. The lobster, you put the lobster into a vat of cold water, you turn the heating on, um, and we are told that as the uh, temperature goes up, each incremental change, the lobster just registers the incremental change uh, and eventually um, you know, becomes dinner. Um, we're like the lobster. We've been put into the cold water. The water is heating up. Uh, the water is now actually very hot water. Uh, we need to realize uh, just how hot the water is technologically and what the impact it is having on our privacy um, uh, before it's too late. Thank you very much. I'm a cyber psychologist, and cyber psychology is the study of the impact of emerging technology on human behavior. So for those of you who are not familiar with cyber psychology, I'll just do two or three quick slides just to tell you a little bit about it before I get into the main part of my talk. 
I'm a director of the uh, Cyber Psychology Research Centre. I'm also a fellow at um, a research fellow at the um, Network Science Research Centre in the US, and a fellow at the School of Law in Middlesex. And I actually engaged in these different disciplines as part of my own philosophy that really we need a interdisciplinary approach to the problem space. And it's great that Jürgen has assembled a panel with a mixture of various skill sets coming together to actually address the uh, problem space tonight. So what is cyber psychology? It's a field within applied psychology. It's about 15 years old now. And effectively, we deal with internet psychology. We also deal with virtual environments, artificial intelligence, <coughs> AI, and IA intelligence amplification gaming, digital convergence, mobile telephones and networking devices. There are now over 30 peer-reviewed journals publishing in the area and generating about a thousand papers a year and growing quickly. So Jan says that cyber psychology will enjoy exponential growth due to continued rapid acceleration of internet technologies and the unprecedentedly pervasive and profound influence of the internet on human beings. So when I'm giving a lecture, people say to me, why do you say human? Why don't you say people? I use the word human to actually emphasize the difference between technology and people, effectively. So the tech human technology interface. So what is the psychology of cyberspace? Well, there's enormous interest in cyberspace at the moment from a psychological perspective, Cognitive, social, educational, organizational, personality, clinical, and experimental psychologists are all very interested in what's happening in this domain. Many years ago, I did my undergraduate degree in psychology, and then about 15 years ago, cyber psychology arrived on the scene, and I looked at it and I thought, I understand that. And that was at that stage. So now it's even more relevant and becoming increasingly more relevant. John Suller, who's a, acknowledged as the founder of cyber psychology, he's a professor of cyber psychology at Ryder University, and he asks a couple of questions. He questions as to whether traditional psychological theories, the real world studies that we have to date, will they suffice? Do we need to modify them, or indeed do we need to develop new ones? The important thing is that interdisciplinary scholars are moving together, we're crystallizing new ideas, and we're working towards a new scientific frontier. I worked for a year and a half with the network scientists at MIT on a project for the White House where we were invited to uh, study technology facilitated or technology solutions to technology facilitated human trafficking. And it was fantastic to get that interdisciplinary perspective. I was coming out from it as a cyber psychologist. They were coming at it as network scientists. I remember one conversation with Dr. Steve Chan where I was rapidly asking questions and he said to me, Mary, just a minute, I am processing. I thought, okay, <laughs> there is the difference. So we know that technology is now ubiquitous. 2.7 billion people, almost 40% of the world's current population are now online. As cyber psychologists, we talk about state and trait in cyberspace. So I don't have time tonight to go through all of these um, sort of theoretical constructs within cyber psychology, but I'll just run through them quickly. So we're all aware of anonymity. And I stress, I mean, essentially, I'm pro technology. Technology doesn't have to be a negative thing. And the problems that are associated with technology clearly in time they will be addressed by technology solutions. I like to say that technology was designed to be rewarding, engaging and seductive for normal populations. Did anybody really think about criminal, abnormal or vulnerable population? And essentially a lot of the problems that we have come down to addressing issues that, that are specific to those populations. And within vulnerable populations we have to think about minors and children. So online disinhibition, this is a theory of Professor John Suller and it dictates that people do things in a virtual context that they wouldn't do in the real world. 
So we only have to look at politicians taking inappropriate images of themselves and circulating them to ask the question, how could you possibly do that? And the answer is quite simply, it's disinhibition, and specifically disinhibition online. Cyber immersion and cyber presence, self-presentation online, the internet privacy paradox. Owen mentioned this earlier in his, his talk. It's a form of sort of cognitive dissonance with youth that they will know that they shouldn't make certain things public, but they feel compelled to do so. And when you ask them, why on earth did you put that photograph online? Or why did you, why did you share it? And they say, but I only shared with my, it with my friends all 450 of them, and all 400 and so forth of their friends. Escalation online. I'm leading a project for Interpol at the moment where we're looking at youth behavioral escalation online and specifically self-generated indecent content by minors, what, what has been referred to as selfies, but indecent uh, selfies. And they are de facto child pornography. If you're underage and it's an indecent image, not are you only are you generating child pornography, albeit of yourself, you are also distributing it. And that's very important to remember. So there's an educational piece there. Hyperpersonal communication, another entity online, Walter, and altruism, a very positive aspect of technology. So here's a couple of interesting statistics. I was reading very carefully through the Ofcom report a couple of months ago, and I was actually startled by the top stat there. 28% of three to four-year-olds now use tablet computers. This is a UK study. South Korea, 93% of three to nine-year-olds go online for an average of eight to nine hours a week. 25% of three-year-olds go online daily in the US. And that statistic was generated in 2011. So in a country where freedom of the internet is so important, you have to ask the question, who is actually looking after those three-year-olds online? Are there filters in place at all times? And what is their online experience? In Australia, 79% of seven to eight, oh, sorry, five to eight-year-olds go online. And in Ireland, 63% of children report using the internet several times a day. And this is higher than the European average. Specifically in terms of cyber ethics, the top stat there, which came from the Ofcom report, 14% of parents of infants aged three to four said that they knew less about the internet than their child. So I suppose that statistic really stopped me in my tracks and I thought, well, who is going to care for these children? And therefore, as a society, what sort of duty of care do we have to actually protect minors in this, in this regard? So studies like this help to really inform the overall debate as to who's responsible for protecting the child in this age of rapid technological change. So what do we consider in terms of ethics in this space? Well, it's generally called cyber ethics. But the question is, are cyber ethics different from real world ethics? And I would argue no. I'd say the reality is that computing technologies just bring a new dimension to existing ethical issues. So there's a cluster of ethical issues that surround the child technology interface. Of course, the internet provides opportunity for young people to learn, to communicate, to share, to explore, but it also poses risk. Some risks, such as cyberbullying, which Connor will discuss later, are apparent. Some risks, we don't know about them as yet. I wrote an article for the journal, and actually the lead opening sentence in the article was a quotation from the great uh, Canadian forensic uh, psychologist, Michael Sito. And he said, we are living through the most interesting, unregulated social experiment of all time, a generation of youth that have been exposed to content online. And in fact, in the journal article, one of the comments below from obviously some sort of a keyboard warrior was, well, I stopped reading when I read that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> so the point is that we don't have to be in different camps. It doesn't have to be, let's regulate the internet versus freedom of the internet. The solution lies somewhere in between. 
Specifically, I want to talk about the ethics of child technology interface and specifically interface with machine intelligence, with algorithms. So in a real world context, and I say real world and virtual world to differentiate between the two, parents and caregivers decide what is suitable for children. In cyberspace, we have to ask the question, is artificial or machine intelligence in charge? But from the point at which a child logs on, whether it's search, whether it's using a communication platform, whether it's social networking or gaming, they are interacting with algorithms. So for example, if your teacher introduced your young child to an undesirable person, you would hold the teacher accountable, or if a neighbor did the same thing. But when an algorithm makes an introduction, who's responsible? And who supervises that transaction? And to take a real world metaphor, if your son or daughter is online playing a first person shooter game, and say they're 13 or 14, I know that's underage for those games, but the likelihood is that they may be that age. So they're playing that in the room and you're happy because in the room and they're playing. If you walked out into the street and saw your 13 year old son playing with four men aged from say 25 to 45 and kicking a football around, would you be concerned if they were all strangers? Or would you just say, oh, that's shooter boy 100, he must be fine. So the point is in the real world example, we like to know who our children associate, who would they play with. Why do we just abandon this then when they go online and think that it's some sort of harmless transaction? And the point about these games is that in these games, friendships form, loyalties are built. And that can lead to, to other more undesirable entities. We always think about social networking platforms in terms of grooming. The current research that I'm involved with, with Middle East Sex University, we're looking at first person shooter games as platforms for grooming for radicalization and for grooming for sexual deviancy. In terms of the ethical issues to be explored, I talked about search engines acting as associative indices. Again, I did uh, an interview with a journalist last night and people are so protective of cyberspace because it's a new frontier and it's freedom of the internet. But I say yes, but not at any cost and certainly not at the cost of the rights of a child. And in a real world context, we go to great trouble to actually protect children. You know, the responsibility is put on parents' shoulders, well, you are responsible for your child. But think again of another real world example. Do we expect children, parents to stand outside the front of public houses or uh, off licenses standing there saying to children, do not come in? Or to man the cigarette counters in, in news agents? We don't. As a society, we, we create laws or we create regulations or even self-regulation where that process is going to take place. Now we don't want to turn the internet into a child's playground, that's not the idea. But what I am saying is we need smart and workable solutions that we can actually protect children in this domain, particularly if we're going to allow them to access it. And it comes back to a children's rights issue. And this is another area that as academics we're exploring along with them, um, some legal academics who are experts in this area, um, including Owen, <laughs> we're looking at the rights of the child. I would argue that in, in a real world context, when we were importing clothing from third world countries, we boycotted that clothing if we found out that they were using child labor in the factory. Because we said, basically, the children who are working on these trainers are being deprived of the right to a childhood. Well, I would argue that children who access content online that may be legal, but not age appropriate, they are being deprived to the right to innocence, deprived of the right to a childhood. And I have to declare my, uh, <laughs> my position here. I'm a, an observer to the Interpol Specialist Group for Crimes Against Children. And somebody has to be the voice of the child among all of the freedom of the internet uh, <laughs> supporters. Where is the voice of the child? And as a society, where 
is our voice in terms of protecting the child. Here's an interesting quote. Despite the importance of large-scale search engines on the web, very little academic research has been done on them. That was by Bryn and Page. We know who they are. So that was back in 1998, the founders of Google. I would argue that that remains the same. There is a positive research and debate regarding the societal impact of pervasive technologies on vulnerable populations, especially children. So what can we do? As cyber psychologists, and I've sort of done a Venn diagram here to show how we fit into the equation. So over here, you have the child and entities that are important from a psychological, from a developmental uh, perspective. And we haven't even begun to talk about uh, neuroscience and actually the impact of technology on very young infants. <laughs> and I think that um, in terms of increasing our interdisciplinary approach, it's going to be very important to start looking at that. I haven't seen any studies that actually uh, examine this topic in, in a meaningful way. There are lots of blogs and lots of posts, but I haven't seen any studies. But there's the catch as well. We would need a longitudinal study to actually assess the, uh, the impact. I'm not presuming that it's damaged, but uh, certainly the impact. But do we really want to wait for that? Or can common sense prevail in the meantime? So over here, we've got issues to do with technology, big data, governance, artificial intelligence, IoT. Anybody know what IoT is? IoT is the next thing that's coming. It's called the Internet of Things, and it will dom dominate technology. We talk at the moment about humans interfacing with uh, devices. Wait till devices start talking to devices. That will be most of the traffic on the net. We had our first event the other day of the first uh, incidents of a device generating spam. A fridge sent out three quarters of, three quarters of a million uh, spam emails. So that, everybody thought that was quite funny. One of the issues here that I'm going to point to, and I think it's really key in terms of the problem, is authentication and age verification online. And that is one of the solutions to the uh, problem space in terms of using technology to actually solve the problems that are caused by technology. So a couple of important research issues for the future of a better internet. In terms of the cyber psychology of the child, self-endangerment is a big issue. And actually, the German federal government, this is their uh, terminology translated from the original German, which I won't try and uh, pronounce. And the idea of children placing themselves in danger online. I was at, speaking at an EU uh, policy summit recently, and they've had a 10-year campaign about safety online. And my argument was that it's been a one-dimensional message for children. So if you say to a child, that's a haunted house, don't go in and play in it because it's dangerous, what are they going to do? If you say all of your messaging is about safety online, the implication then is that the internet is somehow fundamentally unsafe. And we've seen an increase in risk taking online. So could it be that you know, a decade of telling children, hey, here's an unsafe place, has maybe encouraged them to go there and take risks? I've spoken about state and trait. I've spoken about age appropriate development. The good news is in that in Ireland, the government is actually paying attention. The Minister for Communications recently put together a internet content governance advisory group of long title, and I sit on that group. But we have representation from industry, from, from computer science, we have full representation on that group. And we're actually looking at this area of legal but age inappropriate content online and the impact of that on children. The second area is to consider cyberspace as an environment. Technology now is not a simple extension of the telegraph or the telephone. You have to start thinking about technology as we think of it as cyber psychologists, as an environment. Online and offline, they're generational constructs. When children, children are always on. And when they engage with cyberspace, they are immersed in an environment. So we have to think of it in an environmental context. And also, we need to think about the ethics of the impact of technology on the developing child, as I've discussed previously. 
I say policy and governance. I don't like the word regulation of the internet because I don't think that will deliver a solution. So we're looking at an interdisciplinary cyber psychology informed approach, theoretically profound, experimentally rigorous, developmentally longitudinal, and technically sophisticated to achieve long-lasting positive societal effects. We should consider principles of virtual research methodology when uh, conducting research in this realm, and focus on youth developmental aspects, and bear in mind ethics in cyberspace. So President Higgins, he said that he wanted this to be a presidency of ideas, and this is a quote from him, recognizing and open to new paradigms of thought and action, seeking to develop a public discourse that places an ethic of active citizenship at its heart. As a cyber psychologist, I'm interested in active cyber citizenship. And the question is, how does an ethically aware society step up, so to speak, in an age of technology? So there's an old proverb, a proverb, I think was African in origin, and it said it takes a ch village to raise a child. But remember, this is also true in cyberspace. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, to be able to share some of the work that we're doing in this area. Obviously, it's uh, a microwave approach. There's so much that can be talked about here. And I'm always guided by uh, John Donne, no man is an island. And I certainly don't do all of the work in this area. And I pay tribute to a couple of colleagues who are just sitting in front of us here. Murray Smith from the Anti-Bullying Center, great work in the, the legal aspect of it. Professor Stephen Minton here as well, and his seminal work in the area, especially around ultrophobia, which I'll probably link to a little bit later on. Um, one thing I would say, uh, you've had a couple of presentations, take a deep breath, have a bit of a sigh, have a smile. And I think what I'm trying to say with this slide is that we keep talking about policies and we're talking about regulation, we're talking about all of these things and we're, things cost money. As a psychologist and a psychologist in education, I think sometimes where I come at this is that not everything has to cost money. And sometimes just saying something nice, being a nice person, you know, having a moral backbone there, thinking about the ethics of what we're doing, that can be more than enough for what we're actually up to. But I think we could get into panic. It's all the new technology, the cyber psychology, the cyber bullying, the legal stuff. And you know, we could feel a bit overwhelmed. And, and I must say, I was, I was very gratified with Owen's presentation. And it, with that kind of approach, I think we can overplay a lot of the, you know, the, the paranoia of, of the legal aspects of stuff. It is very serious, but I think we have to have a very balanced understanding of these things. And I think that's what uh, the three speakers, that's what we're trying to do tonight. And, to keep that with every bit of new technology there is a lot of widespread social attention and obviously president higgins and the ethics initiative we wouldn't all be here tonight if we weren't interested in the influx and the importance of new technology on society but if we don't properly understand it if we don't educate ourselves and think about these things and be a reflexive society then we can get into moral panic let me take you back just a couple of years okay when the sewing machine was first introduced, there were people who feared the implications that women moving their legs up and down would affect female sexuality. When I go out to the shed at home and I see that Singer sewing machine there, I, I think about my father in a different way now. Um, <laughs> even just more recently, the Walkman music player, when it was, it was introduced, it was viewed as an evil device that would encourage people to disappear into separate worlds, unable to communicate with each other. So every time we get something, there's the panic, the knee-jerk reaction, the misunderstanding. And maybe, and hopefully what I'm trying to put across tonight is, maybe we need to go back to basics. Maybe we need to slow down a little bit. Maybe we just need to calm down a little bit. Yes, there are all of those negative things, but let's be self-reflexive. Let's do those things. Let's think about all of the good things that we have that we can put in place to help ourselves to help children and to help the generations coming after us. I think we already have the answers. It's just reflecting on where those answers are. So I think if we're going to deal maturely with cyberbullying and with all of the issues that my colleagues have talked about as well, I think we need to take a step back and just think about how we as adults and members of society even think about traditional or face-to-face -face bullying. And, you know, children learn a lot at home. This little picture, it's your headmaster fatty. He's worried that you're being bullied at school. 
you know, as they say up at home, they don't lick it off the stones. They pick it up from us. So what messages are we giving children at home that they carry forward into school? The role of society and media. Like everybody gets very exercised about the 9 p.m. watershed and what we can show before or after 9 p.m. I get horrified at what we can show before or after 4 p.m. And we can have television programs where we can tell people very derogatorily, you are the weakest link. So children copy that. Children think that's an, an appropriate reaction and they carry it forward. What messages are we giving children? Don't forget by the Constitution, we are the primary educators, the family, the primary educators. Then thinking about how boys and girls and the realities and, and what we think about bullying and the facts and the myths and the realities. This little picture says, Janet set aside an hour each day to work on her threatening letters. Up to very recently, we didn't actually believe that girls could be aggressive. We didn't include them in bullying research. And then when we did, we actually conceptualized that from a very male-oriented perspective. But we actually know now uh, girls and boys bullying to the same extent, just using different methods and different means. And sorry, the little bit at the bottom, uh, it's really just that bit, you know, as a psychologist, I come across a lot of parents, especially of primary school children, and they will freely admit that their daughter could be a victim but they could never admit, and no. She's got a door of the Explorer bag. She's got pigtails. She couldn't be a bully. So there's a, a, a complete mismatch in reality of the view that we have even of her children. And I speak for probably most of my psychologist companions that are here today as well. I have yet to meet a parent of a baby or a one-year-old or a two-year-old who actually says to me, Connor, don't worry about them. You know, they're not really that intelligent. Or they actually say, Oh, they're so intelligent, they're so smart, they're beyond their years. Well, with that, I have great hope for the future with the generations that are coming along. They're all super smart and super intelligent. So I've put this notion of the always on generation. That was one of the early things that were said about these uh, young people. They're now actually probably the age of being the new school teachers that we have in schools, the new guidance counselors that we have in schools, the always on generation from 10, 15 years ago they're the people who are now educating the children. So we've moved whole scale very, very quickly. Uh, there's a typo in this, but it's not my typo. Uh, no, you weren't downloaded, you were born. <laughs> and it is that mismatch. And again, I think some of the stats that Mary put up, uh, we're talking about digital infants and digital babies and things are moving. And the, the misconceptions that, and the conceptions in society as well. But I think we have to be careful not to throw out all the good things. There are incredibly positive things of the internet, of, the, of everything that's going on there for education, for social, for recreation, for families, for bringing families closer. If it's harnessed and if it's used and if it's understood and if we have the safeguards and the protections and they're very easy to do. All of these social networks, but as I keep saying to, to colleagues, I do have a good social network for kids. It's called outside. But let's remember, and that previous bit was saying, you know, we have great colleagues, Professor Keith Johnson and people in the Center for Research in IT and Education, Crite, take a look at the website, they're doing great stuff. But don't forget that paradox. The internet really is the most open form and form of communication, but it's also the most anonymous. And also remembering that on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, okay? So it is that safety and security, and I think my colleagues have been uh, relating to that as well. So really, I suppose we're at that stage. What is cyberbullying? But I do think it was important to go through those previous slides and I would challenge you to go home tonight and whatever it is you do tonight, a glass of wine, whatever it is you do, have a little think about what you understand to be bullying in schools, bullying in the community, what you do, what your response is and what we as a society are actually doing or not doing. Because if we were doing a lot more, we wouldn't still be talking about it. So there's still a mismatch there in where we're at in society. With colleagues across Europe and across the world, we've been working over the past four or five years on everything to do with cyberbullying. And one of the work groups have been trying to come up with the best, tightest definition around cyberbullying that would sort of help people like my colleague Owen here in terms of the legal aspects of these things. And this is probably the best definition that we have at the minute. Any behavior performed through electronic or digital media uh, by individuals or groups that repeatedly communicates hostile or aggressive messages 
intended to inflict harm or discomfort on others. Whenever you parse that down a little bit, and if you were to take a look at the, the, the definitions for traditional or face-to-face -face bullying, we do have a lot of similarities. Maybe differentiate a little bit, but the behavior is there, the notion of repetition is there, and the notion of the intention is there. So very critical that we have that core definition of what we're talking about, because quite often, and I'm sure my colleague Stephen and Murray here, they'd say, everybody's talking about different things, but if we all start with the same definition, mm -hmm we can understand the parameters of where we're at with it. We're getting to a stage, I think, with the research where we're getting to a better, more mature understanding of the associations or the links or the overlaps between traditional bullying and cyberbullying. And we're actually getting to that understanding that the online stuff, the offline stuff, it's a bit of a vicious cycle. There's actually you know, a lot more fluid aspects to that than would, would have first met people's eyes. A few years ago, we were doing research in cyberbullying, but not measuring traditional bullying. And now we've been doing both, measuring both aspects at the same time. And now we have enough studies that we can actually start to say, is it actually creating any new bullies or victims? Or is it the same people just taking on different roles? So really, I think what we have to be careful of as schools, as parents and a community, is not to get so focused on cyberbullying that we forget about all the traditional bullying that's going on. And Stephen Minton's here, and Stephen has been at the forefront of theorizing and taking forward this notion of ultrophobia around alternative subgroups and subcultures. So that's important. And the work I've been doing with disabled bullying, and rightly so, we have an inclusive society and an inclusive education system, but we have to protect those people as well and understand it. In the research we did on disabled bullying, a third of trainee teachers, when asked how they would deal with it, said they would use natural instincts. That's not good enough for a modern world to be using natural instincts when we're taking people through third level education. Maybe we're failing at what we're doing, but maybe as a society we need to think a little bit more about it. So really, is cyberbullying traditional bullying? Are they all pretty much the same thing? And the good work of Dr. Lucy Corcoran, I'm not sure if she's in the audience this evening, but Lucy's work, really looking at Irish adolescence to the point, maybe we're all using the wrong word. When we talk to young people about cyberbullying, they have no idea what we're talking about because they're thinking about cyber aggression. Two different things. So, you know, if you ask me how often I play squash as opposed to how often I play tennis, two different things. Both use rackets, two different things. So maybe we need to get in to the definition, into the understanding of what we're talking about and what we mean by it. And also, one of the main research themes of this university is about identities and identity development and identities and transformation. And this research theme is being championed by Professor Barkoff, who spoke at the start. And of course, the whole essence of adolescence is to seek out that identity. Who am I? What am I? Why am I different? How am I different from my parents? I've got to try on all these different masks. Today I'm a mod, tomorrow I'm a rocker. We've all done it. So we have to understand that's where they're at. Give them the support and the encouragement to explore all of that stuff, but still to protect them as well. A couple of quick facts. Most children tell us that they won't report if they has been cyberbullied because they think that the reaction of their parents is that they'll remove the iPad or the technology. So they actually get punished for being the victim because they think that their parents don't know how to deal with it. So they're going, why would I cut off that oxygen to myself? So another fact that we have, 40% of cyber bullies, or sorry, cyber bullying victims, when we ask them, what would you do when you're victimized? 40% of them say they retaliate instantaneously. Now, I'd say that's a whole lot different than if I'm in the playground and if I see Professor Gagan on the far side, and I think, well, he's quite wiry and he's quite weedy and he's only five foot nothing, and I'm six foot three, and I'm 18 stone, and I'll push him and stuff. You know, I might think differently if it's uh, <laughs> Professor Odell. Um, you know, he might punch back. But so there's a thought process goes on there when it's face to face and it slows it down. But if it's in my bedroom and it's pa Professor Patrick Gay, he might go, yeah, I'm intellectually more superior. Of course I am. I'm on news talk every Sunday night. I'm 
much better. So he does all of this stuff, and, and, and before we know it, the whole thing escalates. And that's the problem. The escalation, it gets out of control, and they don't have the ability to deal with that. So the big question is, what should we focus on? And really, if I was to pick one thing tonight to talk about, we should be focusing on the word coping, and whether that's at a national level, societal level, school level, personal level, but the word coping, and what can we do? And I would say we have the resources out there. At the front of the handout that I've given everyone tonight, there's a huge amount of resources there that are free. Go and get them. All of the research that we do, it's freely available on the, the university's repository in the library. It's there. The challenge is for you to go and get it. As I would always say, if you don't know it, you can't teach it. So the information is there. So the speed of escalation goes up. Technology is increasing, but where are children? Children today, their emotional development isn't going any quicker, any faster, any better than when we were children. It doesn't go at the same speed as the technology. So sort of just to graph this very, very quickly for us. So emotional development, regulation, stress, coping, we developed them at that sort of normal little trajectory that we all did when we were growing up. We understand that. If we were to think about technology and maybe, for example, the notion of Moore's Law, where it would have said that uh, microchips should, within 18 months, have developed the next microchip to take over from it. So the 286 computer, the 386, the 486, the Pentium, and on and on it goes. So it's rising exponentially. You put the two of those together, you've got technology going one way, normal childhood development going the other way, and we've obviously got this gap. And is this the bit that we as a society, that on an ethical level, that we need to fill that gap? Technology's not going to fill it. Children aren't going to grow up any better, any quicker. Maybe that's the gap that we need to focus on. So is that the role for us as an ethical society? And is the answer as plain and straightforward, going back to what would your granny have said? What would your mom have said? What is basic common sense? A couple of months back, Professor Minton was on the radio and I thought he summed it up quite well. And I think one of my colleagues was saying, if you moved home tomorrow, what would you do? You would scout out the local neighborhood, the local playground, go down to the local shopping center. You'd look for the safe areas, the areas that are unsafe. Now, for example, First Holy Communion, any of the young kids who don't have an iPad mini will have after First Holy Communion. The rate of ownership is coming down and down and down. So what's our response to that? Well, at a research level, and I think that's what you would expect of us at a university, is to be contributing something to society, something that's meaningful, something that's useful. As part of some of the European research projects, we've been working on these quite hard. We've developed the resources they're free and they're out there for you to, to access. So we've been looking at coping at all of those different levels. Uh, the publication on the right-hand side, you know, schools last week now have to have their new anti-bullying policy. We have to be including cyberbullying, homophobia, and stuff like that. These are out there, they're free, they're research-based, they're based on evidence from across Europe. So I'd encourage people to take a look for these. I mentioned the action plan on bullying. That was updated. 2013, last week every, every school has to have that updated. On the right hand side, also very interesting, we have now new mental health guidelines for everyone at second level school. And interestingly, it talks about the continuum of support. Support for all, support for some, and support for a few. And I would challenge any school principal or the government to, to rethink where we're at with guidance counselling within schools. In budget 2012, we lost a lot of the guidance counselling service, but this is the service that can lead on these issues for everyone at school and for the wider community. And interesting piece of research in the middle from colleagues in UCD and the great work that Headstrong are doing. We have that and the My World survey, and the interesting finding out of that was really what is it that people need? What is it that young adolescents in Ireland need to support them in positive mental well-being? One good adult. And I suppose the question then for us is, are you that one good adult? Are you prepared to put your hand up and say, I don't know enough about this, but if a young person asks me, I'll say, I'll try to help. I'll try to understand. Can you help me? And I'll try to help you. Let's, I think tonight, try to start that honest conversation in society. Where are we all at? The resources are out there, but where are we at in terms of our knowledge? Let's support each other. 
And let's not find it a failure if we say as a parent or a school or anyone else that we don't know enough. Let's help each other. That's what we should be doing. Otherwise, we're going back to the Walkman and the Singer Sewing Machine. It's time to move forward. It's time to move the discourse and the conversation forward. So really, to finish up a little bit, I'm advocating slow it down. Let's get back to basics a little bit. And maybe we need to stop worrying about whenever the horse is bolted and get back to the start of that process. Get back to the preventative stage of where we're at. And as a psychologist in education, this is where part of my role is with the research that we're doing and trying to think forward of where we should be. And I think we need to be focusing a little bit more on the basic skills of digital literacy, digital citizenship, and a lot of great work that my colleague Arlene up here is doing out in Merino. So we have a lot of great stuff going on, but back to those things. We have young children, digital infants, digital babies, as Mary has been showing us the stats on, shocking as they are, but they're going to primary school now already sort of hardwired with some kind of an approach to this technology. But is the primary school curriculum? Are the teachers ready? Are we as parents ready? And obviously 14%, I think it was, of parents of three-year-olds were saying, the kids know more about it than I know. So maybe we should be moving that forward and thinking about what is our role. And then as we leave here tonight, thinking about the big societal things. Nor I'm from Northern Ireland. And I think in terms of where this is at, the North actually punches well above its weight. It can't be rocket science for every organization in this society that has an interest in this area to come together and have one forum, one response, one central conduit to get that message out. In Northern Ireland, we have about 30 different organizations and they're all not trying to outdo each other by saying, I've got this and you've got that. They're all coming together in the forum. Maybe that's one thing we should be advocating here. Move the whole thing forward a little bit and help support each other. So again, what will you do after you go away from here? Is it our job to actually now make society a little bit bigger, a little bit better, a little bit stronger for the children coming behind us? I think it is. And I think if that's not your view, then you probably wouldn't be here. So everyone has a reason to be here. And I think it is because we have an interest in this area and an interest in ethics and an interest in where this society is going. So really there are the questions over the glass of wine tonight. What are you gonna do as a person, as someone in society and as a leader in society in whatever role you have? And back to what I said earlier, if you don't know it, you can't teach it. And it's not that we need a whole pile of new resources. They're there and they're free and they're easily accessed. Let's start to engage with them and let's start that conversation. And as we always say, it's possible not to be responsible for the problem, but to be responsible for the solution. And I think on behalf of the three speakers tonight, what we're really trying to do is actually show you where to look, but we're not telling you what to see. And we're very open to the questions that we hope will, will come from you guys after this. We don't want to be saying, this is what you have to do or whatever. We want to actually say to you, here's where to look, but we're not telling you what to see. And if we keep waiting until we're ready, we'll be waiting a long time so let's actually start something and let's start it now and I'm sure you've got some great questions for us. So thank you.